Good night and welcome to Calvary Chapel this evening. Those of you who braved the rain, and those of, you online, and those of you who sit on your couch online, good evening. Good evening to you and good night to us. By the way, those of you online, I want to share with you, when I do say good night, it's because in Belize, the night is a greeting. It's, it's not, good, you know, like, good night. It's, Good night. We're not trying to get rid of you. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, just thanking you again for your love. You gave your life up for us. Thank you so much. And all we can do is worship you, turn our lives over to you, thank you. And tonight that's what we want to do. Let, let our songs not just be songs falling off onto the ground, but let them rise up into eternity and bless you throughout eternity. And at the same time, have your way in our hearts. Change us and make us more like you. Be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
open up the gates.
For those of you men who are going to the men's retreat this week, we're going to meet at 9 o'clock at the bus stop. Of course, all three of you usually go, none of you are going. Um, but maybe online if you're watching tonight. 9 o'clock at the bus stop. If you guys see Benny, tell Benny 9 o'clock at the bus stop. Because I know Benny wants to go. I'm sure he hasn't forgot, but you know, he might have. But he's signed up to go, so... Yeah, tell Benny, 9 o'clock at the bus stop. 
He knows what to bring. We will, we will leave from there. Amen. Well, we had a, a great, you know, Mr. Brian, you missed it. We had, a, we had a room full of men. Actually, this church on Sunday morning was packed, like old days packed. It was great. People were singing. It's like, whoa, we couldn't even hear the instruments. It was, so, it was wonderful, wasn't it? Uh, and we had to have the kids doubled up. And still, we, the kids went out. We were still packed. It was great. And then we had... 20 to 25 guys Sunday night. What? Yeah, you missed out, bro. They all said, where's that Mr. Brian? Isn't he running this thing? I go, I don't know where he is. I don't know. I think he went with his wife somewhere. I'm not sure. He never didn't tell me. So so you missed it. But it was good. And Delano and Kerwin and Kristen shared uh, the Garifuna. I can't always say it. Gar- Garaganu. Garinagu. Garinagu. The Garinagu story and how they got here, and, and it was good. It was, it was a good night. Thank you guys for doing that. It was great. Thanks for coming out and doing that. But th- now we're in Romans chapter 6 tonight. Miss Winnie, you look pretty tonight. I know. I love that. Your dress. That's right, because this is a special week. Yeah, special week. This is holiday. Yeah. Right. Garifuna Settlement Day this week. So. The first five chapters of Romans has dealt with justification. Romans 6 deals with sanctification. And the word sanctification means holiness or being set apart for God or set apart for God's service. Set apart. That's what, you know, that's what holiness means. You know, we always look at the word holiness like, whoa. You know, you got the aura around you, something holy, holy. It simply means set apart. Like God is holy. He is like no other. There's nobody like God. He is set apart. He is holy. See, God has... Uh, we see this word in, in this chapter 6 and verses 19 and 22. Now, God has saved you and I saved us from the penalty of sin, and that is, this is justification. We see it in Romans chapter 1 through 5. Justification. And now, God is saving us from the power of sin, and that is sanctification. We see that in Romans uh, 6 through 8. And then God will save us, save me, from the presence of sin when my salvation is completed. That is glorification. Where... There will be no more sin. We'll be glorified. We, you know, it's just not going to happen. I cannot wait for that day. Can you, I can't even imagine what it's like not to, not to sin, you know, or not to fall, or, or, you know, or look at this world the way it is. It's just hard to imagine, isn't it? Because we just, we're born into it. But there's going to come a day when there will be no more sin, no more crying, no more pain. And so Romans 6 deals with these things and how shall I live the Christian life how to live it how can I have victory over sin in my life how can I live a life that is set apart for the service of the Lord Jesus how can I be free from the bondage of sin because you know we, we, we before we were born again we were slaves to sin we had to sin when we got saved we no longer have to do those things that we did before. The opposite of what the world says. Well, you go a Christian, you can't do this, can't do that. Uh-uh, that's not true at all. I don't have to do those things anymore. I've been set free from them. I don't have to go out and smoke a joint after service. I just don't have to do it anymore. So I'm not going to. I'm set free from that. Now, there's three key words in Romans 6. Uh, the first one is no, verse 3, 6, and 9. And then there's reckon. Or deal with, verse 11, and yield in verse 13. And the first, the believer must know the facts. The facts center upon the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. He saved us. It is his finished work. He accomplished this by his death and his resurrection. It's his finished work. He did it. It's done. And see, it's not what we do. 
It's what Christ has already done for us. Know the facts. Secondly, reckon or count on these facts. Consider them to be true. They're, it's the truth. Flat out. People try to tell you it's not. It's the truth. Jesus did it. And then thirdly, yield our lives, our bodies to God as one who is alive from the dead. Because you see, we are a new creature in Christ. A new creation. And when God looks at us, He doesn't see our failings and our falling out and our sin. He sees us finished. Because of the blood of Jesus. What He's done for us. Salvation is not do, do, do. Do, do, do. But it is done, done, done. It's accomplished. He did it. We have been justified, right? You know, justified is, it, it was a legal term. And it means much more than just being forgiven, which, which is wonderful. But, it, but it's a legal term. And, and it means, means this. As though it never happened. Just as, as if justified. Just as if I never sinned. In court, your accusations against you would be thrown out. Never happened. I don't know, you know, only God can do that. Only God can cast our, not remember our sin anymore. I don't know, you know, it's a God thing. Figure that out when we get there. But he does it. Now, preaching grace sometimes, people may think, well, let's just sin. Let's just go for it. It's already taken care of. It's finished. It's accomplished. It's all done. We're forgiven. Our sins are in the past are forgiven. The sins we're doing now, the sins we're going to do are already forgiven and we haven't even done them. So why not sin? Well, let's go now into Romans 6, verse 1 and 2, where it says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? You know, we looked at grace last week, you know, where where sin abounds, grace much more. So hey, what, you know what? Let's sin a lot so there can be a lot more grace. That's how we think, don't we? But it says there, then or therefore, therefore, shall we continue in sin because of grace is there? Shall we just do that? Well, what, what's he say there? He says, oh, no way, man. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? No way. We are dead to sin. Why should we continue doing it? Why, why live in it if we're dead to it? Like I said, some people say, if God's grace is magnified by sin, then I will really sin so that I might even more abundantly show forth God's amazing grace. The world will see it more. Well, look how much he's forgiven. He keeps sinning. He keeps getting forgiven. Oh, yeah. Be careful. You know, the, the hymn, the old hymn, the one that most of us know, Amazing Grace that saved a wretch like me. Wow. I'll even become more wretched so God's grace will appear all more amazing. No. That's how the natural man thinks. Turn the grace of God into shameless conduct. Lust. It, says, it talks about in, in Jude chapter 4. Now, if you as a Christian say a person is saved by grace and not by any works, that means by, you know, how good you are, and if the saved say person is saved forever, then it seems to me that once a person is saved, he can live in any way that he pleases. The world, that's the way it thinks. That's the way the natural man thinks. That's, that way you kind of do what you want. But true believers know, that know the grace of God respond to this in only one way. God forbid. Let it not be. Perish the thought. Get rid of that thought. Those who know the grace of God in truth do not use it as a license to sin. They don't do it. God's grace teaches just the opposite. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, 
instructing us in to instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. You know, if we're really children of God, we should hate sin and desire to be free from the slavery to sin. It, it, it just should be. I mean, it, I cannot wait for that day to get out of this body and have that new eternal body that doesn't sin. I cannot wait for it. Now, in verse 2 there, once again, when he, when he says that, may it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? And that's not really a command. It's, you know, it, he's, he's saying, why would you want to? Why is it? You know, he's not, it's not a command. He's just throwing that thought out of there. We died to sin. Why would we want to do that? Then verse 3 of Romans 6 says, or Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. We've been baptized into Christ spiritually, and, you know, most of us, you know, we had water baptism also. And water baptism is really a, a picture of the spiritual baptism. Because I am Christ, I have been identified with Him in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Because I am in Christ. So baptism is that is the fact that I died with him and I rose with him. And you know, that's even, you know, when you see, when we do water baptism, that's what the picture of it. It's like the old man dying and washing away that sin and coming out of the water, a new life. And it happens spiritually. Because I am in Christ, I am a new creature, new creation. I, you know, I'm not a dog or nothing. I'm talking, you know, I, I'm still human. And so water baptism is also a picture of that. A new life and a new walk. That's why a lot of times when I baptize somebody, I say, you know what? It's, it's like when you, after you baptize here in the water, just know you're new. Just, this is the picture of it. And now walk in newness of life. Because I am in Christ, I am a member of His body, the church. Because I am in Christ, I have forgiveness of my sins. All of them. In baptism, water baptism is a symbolic picture of the washing away of my sins. And because I am in Christ, I am not under condemnation. I like that one. Romans 8, 1, you know. Therefore, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, that, that scripture. Free from guilt. I never realized that when I was first saved. You know, I knew my sin was forgiven I didn't know that, you know, I, I, didn't have, I didn't have to walk in guilt anymore. That, you, know, he, you know, I didn't have to be guilty anymore. Because, you know, there's things when you, the enemy throws in those darts at you, you know, and firing, and you say, but look what you did when you were younger. Well, look what you did. Until you realize, you know what? Forgiven by the blood, I don't have to be guilty. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Huh. I'm a new creation, new creature. I don't have to dwell on the old things. I like to share that with people a lot of times in counseling situations when people are blaming their parents for how they are. You know, blaming it on their parents. I see you don't have to blame them. You're a new creation in Christ. You're made new. You're not that old person anymore. That old person is dead. So why dwell on it? Why, why, you know, why, why dwell on it? Verse 6, Romans 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. There it is, wrapped up right there. Knowing this, knowing it, that our old self was crucified with Christ. Knowing this, you know what that means? It means it needs to be believed. You need to believe it. Not just know it, but believe it. Our old man is crucified with him. 
Our old man was crucified with him. Our old self on the cross. You know, the old man is my old life in Adam. Born into this world. Born into sin. Because of Adam's sin. And the new man is my new life in Christ. A spiritual life. One of them, you know, the, the old life is fallen man, and the, and the new, life, new, new life is redeemed man. We're redeemed. We're restored to the Father. We regenerated. We're made new. I like that. And we, and we see it. Sometimes we live in the old man still, in our fallen nature of sin. You know, we still, you know, we're still got this body. We have, you know, we got to always remember I'm dead to sin. I don't have to do it anymore. But sometimes we do. That's the old man. Always trying to come back. The old man is born in the flesh. The new man is born of God. The old man came about about by natural birth. The new man comes about by a new birth. A spiritual birth. The old man is corrupt. Deceitful. Lustful. The new man is after God. Created in righteousness and true holiness. The old man is described by his works. You know, you, you've got Ephesians 4, 25 through 31. He is, he is a wicked liar, has a rotten temper, he's an evil thief, he has a corrupt mouth with garbage flowing out of it. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, unforgiving spirit, and on and on and on. That's the old man. But the new man, the contrast of, with the new man, is he speaks truth, gets angry in the right way of things, without sin. Like Jesus, when he came into the temple and he cleansed the temple, you know, you look like, whoa, that was pretty intense. He went in and did the table. But it was a righteous anger. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a sinful type of anger. There's, there is an, uh, a, a righteous anger that you can have. You know, like, if somebody does something when somebody does something to kids and, and nowadays from the animals too and it's just not right you know I get upset indignation you know there was there was a time here when some people didn't want children in our church you know we weren't meeting here we were meeting up up north and I was really upset you know I, I was so upset I, you know I, I, I was thinking I shouldn't be so upset that, you know, I'm in sin. I was thinking I was in sin until I looked up that Jesus was indignant. He was, had a righteous anger. And, and that's the kind of, and I realized, you know what? I'm not in sin. I love the children. I love the people in sin. But I, and I had a, a, a righteous anger that the people acted that way. And it, it was, was not sin. So there is an, an anger that is not to sin. I mean, I wasn't throwing stuff, you know, and and yelling and cursing and stuff like that. I was just upset. That people, how dare you not allow kids in your church? What, what's the matter with you? Why would you not want some people in your church? God loves everybody, you know? And that's the kind of anger I had. Remember this. The old man, your flesh, is stuck. He will never change. Your flesh does not change. Your flesh always wants more. I always, when I worked with high school kids, I would tell them, you know, I didn't allow girlfriends and boyfriends in my youth group. It just wasn't happening. Because, you know, when they broke up, neither one would come to church anymore because they want to see the other one. They go to the youth group, they quit going to church. So no, you know, the outside of it, yeah, and then, you know, you can do what you want. But in here, no. And I would always tell them, and, and, and even if, if you do, when they got a little older, and, and maybe then I would tell them, never be alone. That way you'll never fall. You're not going to fall into sexual morality if you're not alone. You know, be with groups. But I always, I always tell them, you know what, once you start holding hands, you don't go back. Once you kiss, you don't go back to just holding hands. Once you do an intimate kiss, you don't go back to the little hen pack anymore. And so on and so forth. The flesh wants more and more and more. And, and continue. So just stop. Set a, set a limit. Hold your hands. That's it. 
And don't go any further and set your limits. Because the flesh, you always want more. Doesn't your flesh want more money? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, it's the truth. I don't care who it is, no matter how much they have, they, they think they just need a little more. Just, just a little bit more. So how does God deal with the old man? How does he deal with him? Crucifies him. We are crucified with Christ. This, our Savior died on the cross. My old man was crucified there with him. It is done. It is finished. 2,000 years ago. He dealt with our old man and our flesh on the cross. Our sin on the cross. Done. Now, in Romans 6, 6 here... We need to make a difference between our position and our experience. Because this verse is not a reference to the experience of a Christian. Our old man was crucified. It is a fact pertaining to our position in Christ. We are crucified with Christ. In our experience, our old man often seems to be very alive. <laughs> And, we, and so we don't want to go by our experience because, you know, if we did, we would think we were, we'd think we were never crucified. We just have to stand on the fact, I'm crucified with Christ. I don't have to do that anymore. It's who we are in Christ. Listen to Colossians 3, verse 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self and its evil practices and have put on the new self who is renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Laid aside. It says laid aside. And you have put on. The new man has been, was put on the moment we were saved. It happened then. We were saved. We were a new creation in Christ. And now, I, I, have this, this is, I can't remember I got this example. I'd like to give credit to whoever I got it from. but Just knowing that you are crucified with Christ. Two boys down south walking along the road. They see a turtle crossing the road. And the one boy, you know, being a boy, cut the turtle's head off. Gross sick but the turtle kept on walking and one goes he's dead and the other goes no he isn't look at he's still walking no his head is gone yeah but he's still walking and a third friend came by and his name was Bubba and they asked him he said well I reckon he's dead he just don't know it yet <laughs> and that's kind of the way it is with us we're dead to Christ sometimes we just don't know it yet we don't walk in that in that victory. Dead to Christ. Verse 7 of Romans chapter 6. For he who has died is freed from sin. You know, I, I share that a lot here. Because somehow, we just don't get it sometimes. And, and, and to, to remember that, you know, I'm free not to do that. Instead of just going ahead and doing things, you know, come to that place and say, you know, I don't have to do that. And, and the flesh goes, oh yeah, you do. But you know, if you're, if you're walking with the Lord, you know, you're in fellowship, you're reading the word, you're praying, you're just, you know, you're in fellowship with the Lord. It's easier to realize, I don't have to do that. I'm crucified with Christ. If you're walking in the world and hanging out and doing the stuff in the world, you know, you seem to fall just a little bit easier, at least in my experience, you know. You know, when Abraham Lincoln, you know, when he freed the slaves in America, when the U.S. government freed the slaves, there were five things in order they had to do to take advantage of this freedom. Number one was they had to know about it. They had to know they were free. You know, they had to come to the plantation and say, guess what, you're free now. You know, if they didn't come and tell them, they wouldn't know. Proclamation. First thing, they had to know. And second, they had to believe it was true. 
No, can't be. No, they had to believe that it was true. Thirdly, they had to claim their freedom. They had to, you know, pack their bags. When they believed it was true, they had to reckon it, count on it, pack their bags. Then fourthly, they had to refuse to be a slave. Refuse to be a slave, but and to start living as a free person. And then, fifthly, they had to count on all the power of the legislature, legislature that word, of the U.S. to stand behind them. Same as us in Christ. To stand fast in the liberty that he's given to us. The freedom that he's given to us. Romans 6, 8 through 10, is getting towards the end of these verses. Verse 8 says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin for once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Now if we died with Christ, and we did, we believe that we shall also live with him. It's faith. Faith is the key. We just have to believe it. We must believe God's facts. Not behaving, but believing. And believing means following him. You know, going after him, seeking him. So not only are we co crucified with him, but we are co risen with him. We are risen also with him. If he was risen, we are risen. We share in his death, we also share in his new life. What is that? Eternal life. Endless life. In eternity with him forever. See, death no longer has a hold on Jesus Christ. It, it, he conquered death. He came out of the grave. It has no hold on him anymore. So death doesn't have a hold on us either. Yes, you know, these physical bodies are going to die, but we're not going to die. We don't die. You know, the flesh is going to die, but we don't die. You know, I did a funeral on Saturday uh, for this godly woman, and, you know, I was able to share with the family and stuff. She's not dead. She went to sleep. The Bible says, Jesus said, yep, they went to sleep. And, and Jesus says when he comes back, he takes those who are asleep first and then those who are alive remain and go, we go to be with him in the air. She's asleep. We don't die. We live forever. See, Lazarus was raised up only to die again. Christ was raised up never to die again. In Romans 6.11 says, even so consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Isn't it funny how this is over and over? This is sinning over and over. I wonder why, you know? So we get it, maybe? Reckon so, and it says in the, in, in the uh, King James Version, reckon it be so. Even so. What is true of Christ is true of me. And this is the, really the first real command in, in this chapter. Even so, reckon so, believe this, know this. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. He's telling you, do that. Consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You know, the word reckon in the King, in the King James Version, you know, it, it means this. It's a mathematical term. It means calculate or count on. Count on something as being true. And it's a verb in the present tense. So keep on reckoning it. Day after day. Hour after hour. You know, keep reminding yourself of that. So, two facts here. Twin facts, somebody said one time. I died in Christ, and I am alive in Christ. Reckon it so. Old man, I don't have to do that anymore. I am dead to sin. Sometimes you just need to tell yourself that. The last two verses. 
this evening. Verse 12 and 13 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Present yourself to the Lord. Give yourself to the Lord. Even now, Lord, I yield this to you right now. I give this to you. Whatever those things in your life, when they come up. You know what? I'm yielding my life to you right now. When, when temptation comes, Lord, I'm yielding, my, I'm yielding myself to you so I don't go down that road. Ask the Lord to bless you. Ask for His help. Just give your body over to the Lord right at that moment. Right at the moment when sin is creeping at, at the door, it will have no power over you if you yield your body right at that time. Lord, I'm yours. I, I remember one of the first stories I ever heard in church, my pastor Brian, in like 1979, this woman in L.A. or somewhere, inner city area, she was going home one night and this gang got around her and, and they were, you know, we're not going to do nice things to her. And she, so she said to them, well, you know, she, there was nothing she could do. So she just said, I just wanted to happen to let you know that this body belongs to Jesus Christ and I am his. And they walked away. Freaked them out. True story. Yielded. I'm, I'm yours, Lord. And when that, so when that sin is like the gang coming around you, I belong to you, Jesus. Sin, you have no part of me anymore. Use the word. Listen, old man. You're dead. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Why well, come I feel that? <laughs> because of the cross. Use the word of God. You know, use the word of God. You know, I, I don't have really anything against the program, but you don't really need this 12-step program. You need God's one-step program, the cross. Which I think originally the 12-step 12 12 program was based on the cross. All you need is the cross. So, good, good uh, verses tonight to apply into our lives. And so I want to pray that we would remember them at, when we need them, which is most of the time. So, Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the book of Romans. Thank you that we are justified, Lord. We are sanctified and we'll be glorified with you in eternity, Lord. Thank you that we don't have to sin any longer. The old man has been crucified with you, Jesus, and the new man is alive in you. And, Lord, we can seek after you and follow you, Lord, and not go down those roads, Lord, that we once went down. And we can walk that righteous path, Lord. And as we do that, Father, I pray it would not, would not just be for us, but for those we come in contact with and that we see and that really need to know who you are, Lord, that they will see it because we are walking set apart for you and your kingdom. So thank you, Lord. Help us, help us, help us to remember these things and to apply them in our lives, Lord. And just even one thing tonight, Lord, just apply it into our lives. I am dead, but I am alive in you, Lord. Just help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys. Well, God bless you. And we'll put the chairs up tonight. And we'll see you on Sunday morning or some of you on Friday. Amen.